it's amazing what knowledge our ancestors possessed about our land. They didn't even have a satellite capability, and yet uh, I believe it was um, Mr. Um, Bad Heart Bull that drew the Black Hills, Chetapa. All of its rivers. And when they compared that to a satellite image, it was exactly the same. So the land is us. And uh, and the land is us too in reverse. We existed on this land for a long time. We made Wolakota with the land. And that's how we existed to this day. Uh, yesterday I attended a uh, Tribal Historic Preservation Office meeting at the uh, Ramkota. I was a uh, Ramkota yesterday for a couple hours. I had to change from Lakota to Ramkota, so I don't know what Ramkota is, but <laughs> anyway, uh, that meeting was very informative. I mean, I never, they have a lot of information and all the issues, and I didn't know that some of that uh, issues were going on, and uh, it was a good informative meeting that I attended yesterday. And uh, I emphasize uh, working together with the, uh, the TH, uh, HPOs with uh, all the uh, tribal organizations, such as the Wounded Knee Descendants. We need to work with those uh, together And uh, <clears throat> and speaking of, uh, uh, we um, we talked about uh, tail sprays for a long time, and uh, I think Harold Salway uh, Kanashi Harold was a part of that too for a long time, and and. Uh, um, all the other leaders that started that, they're not here anymore. But uh, <clears throat> we still got to try to move forward with what we have. And uh, so having said that, um, I don't know when the next treaty meeting is going to be in spring or whenever, but um, I do have a uh, PowerPoint on Tioshpue and uh, that I like to present at that time, and, and so we can all be uh, informed about what the Tioshpue's roles and responsibilities are, and uh, <clears throat> we need to reestablish all our Tioshpue's. <clears throat> but I think uh, I, 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 I've been saying prayers for the land that where we live at Wakapashte it was getting really fuza dry and our creeks went dry and our stop dams went dry and, <clears throat> and I guess I'm the only uh landowner that uh, I don't have a, a water pipeline into the land. Somehow I'm the only one that don't have that, but I'll have to work on that, I guess. And uh, But this uh, snowstorm is going to help us out and uh, rejuvenate our uh, land and, uh, and uh, we're going to be Standing on some green grass and 
in the spring, I believe, and and, and uh, that's a, that's a neat, that's the ceremony itself of a new year. Uh, I'm glad that's going to happen uh, today, and uh, looking forward to that. So, uh, I, <clears throat> I wanted to uh, say that much. Thank you for listening. And uh, uh, we'll have uh, this afternoon, we'll have another uh, productive uh, meeting with the, with the treaties and our chitty shakoi. Oh, huh. Um, Alicia Swimmer, you are the next presenter, and she will be presenting. The topic area of reservation water quality, and then from there will be um, pipe stolen quarry, fate spotted eagle. Do you need any technical stuff? Um, technical, where's our technical people at? I don't know. All right. <clears throat> These are our, our scientists. Ah. Did you put it on his what's name? I could let me see what you're gonna do. I'll talk to him, okay? He asked when who about us there to report. Han Madakiapi, Alicia Swimmer, Amachiapi Kisho, Mini Luzahan, Imantahan. I am currently a first year's master's student at the University of Kansas, and I grew up here in Rapid City. I also grew up on the Rosewood Reservation. I'm a Sichongu in Oglala, Lakota, enrolled in the Rosewood Sioux Tribe. And I just wanted to introduce uh, what I'm gonna be working on for the next couple of years at KU. As an indigenous studies student, we are multidisciplinary. So a lot of us in our indigenous studies program go into several disciplines, ranging from policy, law, science, history, anything we pretty much want. Um, I think indigenous studies should be included in the STEM field because of the nature of our people. We are already scientists. Uh, so this is called Research by a Foreign with Ocheti Shakoi. Uh, my research interests include policymaking to help protect and rematriate Unchimaka ancestral inherent lands as confirmed by our treaties with the United States of America. Uh, natural law of Ocheti Shakoi to protect indigenous nations, especially within our treaty boundaries. Uh, that includes our people, the animals, plants, everything that we need to live here. And a little bit about my background, I did take a legal studies emphasis at Sinti Gleshko University, which got me more interested in policymaking and law. Um, I did graduate from Haskell Indian Nations University with my Bachelor of Science Business Administration with Management this past May in 2022. Um, I did complete a summer internship with Haskell Environmental Research Studies Institute 
And I'm only bringing that up because I feel like our nation wasn't really represented there. And they're doing a lot of work with helping indigenous students develop research proposals. And they're really concentrating on our people and our interests because most of us that were there have things that we wanna research. And that's the poster that I'm gonna present here too as well. And um, they, they really like to get people from tribal colleges and universities. So if you're from Sinti Gleshka or Oglala Lakota College, I think it's a good thing to get involved with the HERS program because they do pay the students, they house them, they feed them. We visited several reservations, so it was interesting to see how other tribes are doing things to reclaim the land, whether they're relocated or if it's their ancestral lands. And I just wanted to share the UNDRIP Article 10, which basically says um, about our land being taken from us without our consent, and they wanna offer us compensation, but it says the option of return. And the return of our lands should be something that we should all be working on because, I mean, I think we would be the best stewards of our lands like our ancestors did. And this is the research proposal poster that I created this past summer. I presented it at a few um, conferences, but uh, it's basically based off of how the back-end oil industry is poisoning the Missouri River. And the mini Wachoni Rural Water Project, the intake is at the bottom of Lake Oahe, which is a man-made created lake, it's a dam. Um, there are several spills that happen in the back end. So I think if we were able to get funding for this, this is just a proposal that I'm working on, but there's gonna be more to come because I wanna take advantage of my education I'm getting at KU and be able to do research that people of our nation can see fit that aren't you know, in the higher education field that I am at the University of Kansas, which is a, a highly accredited research institution. It's an R1 institution. So this is um, the proposal I created that we would test the headwaters of the Missouri River, which is near Three Forks, Montana. And then between the North Dakota and Montana border, because I know there's some activities in Montana concerning uh, oil extraction activities. And uh, back in oil fields, they spill daily. And a lot of them are on the banks of the Missouri River, which they're using to process their fracking. And there are 1,084 plus chemicals that are used in fracking. And those um, batches, the recipes, they're proprietary. So they're protecting the corporations that are making them and they're not authorized to disclose what's in them or how much is in them. Um, just based on the dangerous chemicals, mainly uh, heavy metals, things that cause cancer and other birth defects and stuff like that. We cut it down to 50 chemicals, um, but still that's a lot because the paneling that they do with water testing doesn't include chemicals like this, especially during the fracking process. And if everybody remembers right before Trump got into office, the EPA pushed out that um, statement on the environmental impacts of fracking. So that was another issue. And the reason why this should concern our nation is because we're supposed to be having the eastern bank of the Missouri River, which means we should be stewarding that river. Um, these dams should never have been put into place because I believe it kind of blocks everything. And heavy metals like arsenic, they drop down to the bottom. And especially there's not that flow to carry it. And then we're getting our water from that area. So I'm not sure if anybody tests for these fracking chemicals in Rosebud but it goes to Lower Burrell and Pine Ridge. So the end point I, I made on this proposal was an upper cut me, and that's just because I have relatives that live out there who could possibly be the ones taking the monthly samples. So I don't have to go up and travel every month up, up to um, our reservation. We also have an end site near Rosewood Casino and another one to the east. 
and that's with the Rosewood Rural Water System. Um, another thing that I wanted to talk about was indigenous data sovereignty. And this is because of the university that I'm at. Um, primarily white institutions are using indigenous data to profit in their careers and personal wealth. Um, as everybody knows with LLC, they're uh, using our language for profit and their own personal gains. Um, our ancestors and the items are being held in these institutions and federal laws like NAGPRA and the American Indian Crafts and Arts Act those aren't really made to protect us. They're made to protect those people, private people with their collections, institutions that are using it for research. Those are all written into these laws to protect them. They're not really made for us. Um, indigenous scholars are needed to help identify these injustices with the support of their indigenous nations. And identifying as indigenous is not enough. You should be supported with a relationship with your people. Um, I know we have like pretendians out there speaking for native people and they're not even like members or that's what I'm talking about there. So the University of Kansas uh, and NACPRA, they found out, well, they said they found out in September of this year that there's 202 native ancestors being stored in Lippincott Hall, which is, uh, you can see where it's pointed to it right there. Um, that's where the Indigenous Studies program was located, and our staff and faculty are Native people, as well as a lot of us students there. So we um, chose to move out of that building, and we're now in the process of being in a different hall, and also sort of demanding that they build a, a community center for our people. They do have a lot of um, our artifacts there. I, I want to say it's like a million and they call them artifacts, but to me, they're um, personal items of people, whether it's their personal effects, ceremonial items, things they were buried with. They're keeping them in there with these human remains. And a week later, they notified us there was two more native ancestors and one aboriginal stored in Spooner Hall. And that one ancestor was attached to a Lakota tomahawk. Um, I have inside uh, information from people in the museum because there are native and they did tell me that that was a scalp attached to a Lakota tomahawk. So I don't know who the scalp would belong to, but during NAGPRA, somebody in the museum decided to separate them. So I don't know if that would be technically one of our ancestors or I don't know the significance of having a scalp attached to a tomahawk like that. And a few days later, they said that there's a South American ancestor being stored in Fraser Hall. And then the inside information I got, they moved that ancestor to Lippincott Hall with the other 202 native. Um, they're calling them culturally unidentifiable. So that's why they're still holding on to them. Um, they have completed steps to repatriate, and they're starting the process again because the last repatriation was in 2007. And this is a sign that they put on the buildings. Um, they're making the Native people be responsible for all the remains, even though one's Aboriginal, one's from South America. So that's an issue right there. Um, students like me are being excluded from the advisory committees formed to, since the recent disclosure. And that's just because um, there's some natives that are from different tribes that are employed by KU. So they have a little bit more um, power to push their personal beliefs on the rest of us, even though we're all from several different nations. Um, Chancellor Doug Gerard has been silent this whole time concerning this issue. Um, the NACPRA later letters are in his office waiting for his signature though. So that's something that I was hoping that maybe the TIPOs here or other leaders can push them to go ahead and get those sent out so they can start that consultation process. Um, so that's what I, I was pretty much asking here too is the research that I'm gonna be doing at KU, um, just looking for ideas, things that if the community sees a need that they think I could do. Um, I'm open to those ideas and also uh, tipos of Ocheti Shakoin to get in contact uh, with me or I gave uh, Phil here some cards of the tribal liaison 
they are running a repatriation series. I know that uh, Dwayne Hollowhorn Bear came and he showed the, his two shirts from his grandpa, Chief Hollowhorn Bear, and explained the spiritual significance of these items. Um, these ancestors that are culturally unidentifiable are claimed by our community in Lawrence, Kansas. So um, KU is located where Haskell is. They're in the same town. So there is a large native community there and there's natives that live there that aren't even associated with the universities, but they're from up here, all the different reservations. So we all know each other in town. Um, so that's what I was wondering if the elders and tipples are invited. Um, they would provide you with your um, input, be able to introduce yourselves and kind of let them know uh, what they would need and they created this website about it. And they wanna meet with native and indigenous community. So that's what I was wanting to invite the tipples to do is, um, I know they didn't send the letters out to you guys, but I was hoping if we could be more proactive on it, they would have to take it more seriously. Um, but yeah, that's just some support that I needed from people. And also which IRA tribes need to be included in this delegation. I wasn't sure where to start looking for the TIPO officers to contact on that one either. Um, and I just want to share that quote by Sitting Bull because I think a lot of people should be involved in um, the science fields and in these higher education universities, especially they're not used to having us around. So they're, they don't know about our opinions on the situation, especially how they're treating these ancestors, moving them around from building to building, and then don't tell us and I think we're the only indigenous studies program in the world to be having to be in the same building as our ancestors. So we're pretty special, but I just wanna thank everyone. Um, thank you, Phil, for inviting me and having um, us here to speak about these situations that we're trying to help with in the higher education field. Um, I do have like a year and a half left in my degree. I'm debating on whether I should go into law school or something like that, because that's mainly where these problems lie is policies. Um, most of these laws are created to protect white people. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> Any questions? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Thank you very much for presenting. <clears throat> We'd like to uh, get the query, Pipestone query. Did you get, you need to zoom for, is she gonna be on? Okay. Okay, they're gonna bring the superintendent of the rock quarry too. Did you connect it? Oh, you got to get there. Can you hear us? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Oh, how me talk here, be you pick it, you scared, damn pet to key. Na pech use papi, i hang tuan he macha, a uspaya mi taaki, a white swan, e mata ha, a mani agdagda ekta i macha ha. E haan akti oyate unki taapi ki i hang tuan o hina, o hina, chanupa o khe a wayan kapi. Mat i macha ha guhaan, kushimi taak chi, 
Isaki Mishima ga O Hina Omakiaka Chantokia etaha Takoja Chanupa Oke Ki Awayanka Tokata Kia Dakto Kakta Gash Inaji. What I said was um, my name is Faith Spotedigo. Um, I'm Ihankuan Dakota. I'm also Sichangu. My grandfather was the first uh, tribal leader at Rosebud. I'm also um, Bde uh, Wakantuya. My grandmother was a Waapia, we, we, and she was at Fort Snelling. And so we are hoping to be at Mankato here in a few days. And her, she is buried at Crow Creek, at St. John's. So I come from a lot of different Oshpaya. But what I said was, when I was growing up, when I would lay beside my grandma, and you know how in our little, we invented tiny houses. We had a tiny house, and we'd all be like hot dogs in a row surrounding my grandma. And she would be telling us, Takojas, you always watch the Chanupa Oche, the pipestone, where we dig our the last of our blood. And so that always, Chantokia Ed Maha, it's always been in my heart, and not just me, but the Ihangton. So we always have watched over the pipestone. Dohan Tak Dok Chana Ohina Misunkana Arvo Unkichopi. We always call him to stand with us whenever there's something. We had a big victory about two years ago when. Uh, the Ihangtuan had a spiritual run for 20 years to try to stop the sale of pipestone at this visitor center. We accomplished it with this strong uh, Ozuya wing that is a superintendent now. She's listening. When you hear her voice and you hear her actions, you think she's a Wiyantanka, but she's a little tiny woman, but she's got a strong mind. And so she said, we can do it. All the previous superintendents would say, you need consensus. You know, you Indian people talk about consensus. So there's 23 tribes, and he said we all have to agree. But she said, no, if the majority of them believe that, we'll do that. So we did. So we stopped the sale of pipestone or pipes at the visitor center. <clears throat> but that hasn't stopped the uh, problem because the community of pipestone was built with our stone, with our blood. And so they have gift shops, and they're acquiring, the last time we went to Is that all right? Last time we had our meeting, we learned many, many things about Pipestone. We learned that it's very, very polluted. The water is poison. So we have to do, that's on our list. The other thing, Magellan Pipeline uh, is still trying to, it was stopped, but they're still trying to nahak um, nabakapi. They're still kicking, trying to figure out a way. So that's another issue that's on the table. And Lauren can tell us about that. But in the meantime, when we had that meeting, we had a tour of the grounds. And on the Wazia Takia, Makocha Ekta, on the north side of Pipestone, I saw a bunch of people digging in the quarry, in the, the stone. And so I asked Lauren, I said, what is that? And she said, those are people querying. And I said, they're Washichu. And she said, that's private land. So these veins go out pretty far outside of the uh, Chanupa Oche, and people are just taking it and they're selling it. And so I said, can we figure out a way where we can do like at Peshla, we all came together and we purchase as much land as we can around the quarry. Because Ehanakji, Ehangtuanki, Woapi, Sutaya, 1858, Ed we We had a treaty. My great great grandfather would not sign the treaty. It was a terrible treaty. But he would not sign it until he said Pipestone was part of our reservation. So for a period of time, the Pipestone was on the Yankton reservation. But you know how these. Um, Washichu uh, Shicha, but you are. They figured out a way. They quit making treaties, but in 1892 agreement, they took 30 years to figure out a way to steal the quarry from us. And they convinced a small group of Ihangtwa. The women were trying to stop it. There was a small group of Wicha that agreed to the sale of the, the fee, the fee title. But we still own the resources. 
And so we're always present there. And there's 23 other tribes, including some of the former members of the Ocheti, like the Omaha, the Iowa. They said they were caretakers like long, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. So we prayed. Every time we go there, we're not allowed to get in the water because it's poison, but we pray for the water and all of a sudden something presented itself. So what we are going to share with you today is that some, and we have to look at it very carefully because we always want to make sure that everything is otana, is uh, straight and good. So we, Lauren, this uh, little warrior woman that I talked about, she went out and made contact with several people and she contacted the Minnesota Land Trust. And they are interested in working with us. They contacted the Ihangtua, we met with them. We looked at what they do. We have a representative, Chad is here, and Lauren will give the background of where, how we came to this far. And the agreement in, making, in meeting with them is to bring it to the other members of the Ocheti to share with you what we're trying to do and that we need you to come aboard so we can make this happen because there's all kinds of things that need to be done there. And the land trust has done quite a bit of work in conservation. And so uh, I'm gonna introduce Lauren Blasic. Are you there, Lauren? Yes, I am. I'm so sorry about the technical difficulties. Okay, you wanna go for it and do your introduction? Sure, thank you, Faith. Um, and I'm sorry, I had terrible timing jumping in um, and being able to hear and realizing that you were talking about the, the theft of the land faith, which certainly the history at Pipestone is a history of injustice. And that's a little of what I'd like to cover this morning. Um, I just want to express my appreciation to Faith and to um, the, the treaty committee and to Phil for being invited into this space. It's such an honor. I'm so sorry that I can't be there in person. Um, I am, I'm not a good winter driver. And I hope that everyone's families are safe in this bad winter storm and really grateful to Chad for um, kind of responding to, to the call for land protection and being willing to talk about how the land trust can help and um, flying out to, to Rapid City to be there in person. I am the superintendent at Pipestone National Monument. I've been there for about five years Every day is an education um, and, and really an honor. Um, starting with like on my, my first week in the job, having the opportunity to talk to Faith and learn about um, the history I, I never learned in school and the history specifically of Pipestone. So I'd like to just share that briefly. I know Faith has already shared it and, and please step in if there's anything I'm getting wrong. Um, but the Yankton in their treaty of 1858 negotiated for one square mile around the pipestone quarries to be protected as part of their reservation, even though the people were forced to live on a reservation that was nearly 200 miles away. They wanted to see the pipestone quarries protected and some historical estimates put it at 90% of the quarrying happening around that time and continuing into the early 1900s was being done by white people. Um, so the pipestone was being exploited and um, this reservation was, was put in place as an attempt to protect it. And yet immediately um, the trespasses began. Homesteaders constructed on the reservation at a time the mayor of Pipestone had his homestead on the reservation. The federal government allowed a railroad to be built through it. And then in 1893, the Pipestone Indian School was um, built on the reservation. And at every turn, with every one of those acts, the Yankton, Yankton people protested. Um, the federal government eventually moved the homesteaders off the reservation, but the railroad and the boarding school remained. This was seen as a real problem for the federal government. At times they acknowledged that the Yankton did own the land. And at other times they claimed that Yankton just had a right to quarry and didn't own the land outright. Um, so in their 
desperation to own and control this one square mile, they sent Indian agents to coerce an agreement with the Yankton um, that as Faith was saying, they, they didn't actually have a legitimate vote of the full general council, but only allowed men to vote and coerce that vote through withholding, withholding rations. Um, and yet in that agreement, the Yankton included a clause that said, if after one year, Congress has not ratified this agreement and has not upheld this agreement by paying the Yankton, then the agreement's null and void, the federal government will drop its claims and admit that Yankton owns this land outright. And so after a year, after several years, Congress still hadn't ratified the agreement and, and never did. Um, so by the terms of the agreement, the, Yank the land should have plain and simple been owned by the Yankton. And yet the federal government continued, the trespasses continued not to acknowledge that ownership. And so over the course of a generation, 30 years, the Yankton took their case all the way to the Supreme Court. And in 1926, the Supreme Court technically sided in Yankton's favor and said, the US government stole this dishonestly. Um, but the decision they made was, and, and this is a quote that stands out from that decision, nothing remains but to sanction a great injustice. They ruled that because all this development was already in place, all they could do was order the U.S. government to pay that monetary settlement with interest, but give the federal government the land. Um, so that's what happened after the Supreme Court decision. And just a decade later, Pipestone National Monument was established. Some of the advocates for the monument were actually people who had been advocates for Yankton, who had been in the room during the Supreme Court case, saw the spiritual significance of the quarries and were concerned about how they were being exploited by non-Native people. So the establishment of the monument included Included the right for Native American people and only Native American people to continue to quarry pipestone. And that's the park's primary purpose today. As a unit of the As National Park Service, Service, we also exist to protect all the natural and cultural resources within our boundaries. Um, and also, as we're learning through tribal consultation, need to do a lot more to think beyond our boundaries and to provide for the education and enjoyment of the general public. We have a lot to learn. Um, consultation began with 23 affiliated tribes around 2005. And I think we've come a long way in how we're caring for this site since then, but again, have a long way to go in learning what it is we're protecting and how we do that in the right way. Um, and that's why I'm so humbled to get to work with faith on a regular basis, many other tribal partners and, and be able to participate in a meeting like this one. So if there's one thing I've learned through consultation, it's that those 300 acre boundaries are arbitrary and that the significance of Pipestone and the spiritual landscape has nothing to do with those boundaries, extends far beyond them. And a lot of the threats that we see to that spiritual landscape are outside the boundaries of the monument. Number one among them is pollution in the Pipestone Creek. The Pipestone Creek that flows through the heart of the monument, through the center of the quarries, um, sadly today is, is badly polluted. Outside the monument, it's been channelized into a ditch. And so agriculture runoff, stormwater runoff, has led to the presence of high nitrates, of E. coli, and of pharmaceuticals in the creek. Um, visual impacts where once you would have looked across the pipestone landscape and seen endless prairie uh, and, and medicinal plants, today there are more and more intrusions on that landscape to the point where, you know, the other night I got in my car and I could see Christmas lights. Um, so visual impacts from residential development and from business development, which also contributes to light pollution and 
we would like to be able to protect the dark night sky at Pipestone so that being there, you know, at, at nighttime is also an important part of the significance of that place and still being able to see the stars from Pipestone. Um, the spread of invasive species is, is hastened by neighboring development. We work hard to protect the native prairie plants and remove invasive species through things like prescribed burns. But the more development takes place neighboring us, the more pressure we see from those invasive species. Um, but I'm, I'm really excited to be here today because we get to talk about maybe some opportunities to protect the land better and for the land to be returned or some of the land to be returned to tribal ownership. So I'd like to highlight just a couple of key parcels before turning it back over to Faith and Chad to talk about what might be possible on these parcels. The area that you see in yellow, well, the, the black boundary is the boundary of the National Monument, the 300 acres. And then the area in yellow to the south is owned by the Pipestone Development Corporation. They had planned to develop this as residential housing. So it's, it's very close to the quarries. Um, that housing would have been highly visible and impactful from many places within the monument, including the quarries. And now through conversations with the Hongtawan Treaty Steering Committee and the Minnesota Land Trust, we might be able to, to have a different vision for that property. Um, likewise, the area in red to the east of the monument is owned by the city of Pipestone. A portion of the Pipestone Creek flows through that property. You can see how it's been channelized and how that really increases the stormwater runoff. Um, and the city of Pipestone is now considering rezoning that for light industrial development. But again, I think we have a chance to put an alternative vision before the city, um, before that happens. And so now I'd like to, to pass it back to Chad and Faith to talk about the work of the land trust and how this might be a tool to returning some of the land to tribal ownership. Hello everyone, uh, thank you, Lauren. Um, my name is Chad Kingstrom. I'm the program manager for Southwestern Minnesota at the Minnesota Land Trust. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Thank you to Faith for the invitation. Um, and uh, I, I'd like to say that uh, I'm a native of Western Minnesota. My family has lived there at listening to your stories today since part of it since 1871. So we're a part of, our family is a part of that landscape. Um, I've only been at the landscape, at the Minnesota Land Trust for about a year. Um, and we, as Lauren said, we heard about this opportunity to work at the, with the National Monument and with Faith. Um, can you go ahead, please, Lauren, to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, this is the mission of the Minnesota Land Trust. Um, the Land Trust protects and restores Minnesota's most vital natural lands in, in order to provide wildlife habitat, clean water, outdoor experiences, and scenic beauty for generations to come. And part of that, more specifically, is we recognize that to protect natural habitat, that also means protecting the areas around that really important natural habitat. Um, you can see on this map, the yellow dots represent places where the Land Trust holds a conservation easement. And so we work all across all across the state. Um, there are no yellow dots down in southwestern Minnesota yet, but um, there will be soon. Um, go ahead, Lauren. A uh, little bit of background on the project. I was approached um, by uh, my partner from the Fish and Wildlife Service and said that he had been talking to Lauren and they called me and brought me in. And we had a meeting in September just to discuss um, an opportunity to do some protection on the parcels around uh, around the, the monument there. Lauren identified some parcels that are under threat um, for, you know, it's important for viewshed issues and, and pollution. There are more parcels around, around the, the monument that we're thinking about, but the two we showed on that first map are just the two most important ones to start with. Um, 
Go ahead, Lauren. So at the Land Trust, we have some different tools that we can use. The conservation easement is our, is our most important one, and we'll talk about that a little bit more specifically. We get state funds through Minnesota's Outdoor Heritage Fund, and then and so we have grants all throughout the state, and many people like myself who are doing conservation work throughout the state, we get, um, there's money for almost every part of the state to do easements. Um, we can also work with other partners um, to find funds that are not state funds to do easement and to do conservation protection. We also have the ability to buy, to buy property. And so the land trust is, in this project specifically, is committed to sort of using all the tools we have in our toolbox to try to meet those, these goals of protecting land around the monument and addressing those threats that, that Lauren talked about. Next, please. Next, please, Lauren. Thank you. And these are, this is a list of, oh, back one. There, this is a list of things that we do when we're, when we're doing a conservation easement project. Um, really just we're finding out everything we can about a property from its, its uh, possible pollution to negotiating the terms of a conservation easement. Basically that says, you know, the, the most common things that we will restrict when we do an easement is the ability to farm, to the ability to build on it or to subdivide a property. So that's that um, negotiation that we, we do with the existing landowner. Right now, as Lauren said, the existing landowner of, of the first parcel we're gonna talk about is the Pipestone Development Commission. So that landowner has agreed to allow us as the land trust to negotiate with someone who might be a future landowner to, to determine what those conditions will be on that property. But um, one that's important I wanted to draw out is the habitat management plan. That's another thing that we do for every, every property, but we'll do that in concert with whoever might be the, the, the landowner in this case in the future. Um, go ahead, Lauren. This is just a basic, pretty basic graphic of what how a conservation easement will impact the, the value of the land. We use a market rate appraisal. And so we determine the conditions of that conservation easement. Essentially, the land trust is going to buy away certain rights from that property, the right to farm, for example, the right to build or the right to subdivide. And then the remaining value is, is the darker on the bottom. So the easement, we'll use, we can use state funds to buy certain rights away from a property, and then there's residual value left in that property. And then that can range from maybe we'll buy 80% of the value of the property or for only 40% of the value of the property. It really just depends on the appraisal and that the specific nature of that, of that property. So in effect, what it does is by having the land trust say step in in the middle and to do an easement on a property, if it's going to go to a different group, we can reduce, significantly reduce the cost of that parcel for the subsequent landowner. Next, please. So a little bit more about the, this particular property. We are engaged with the, with the property owners. They've agreed to move forward with this process. Um, but, you know, to take a step back, we're not, it's not our intention to just barrel ahead and to go forward. If, if this group or another group and would like to be the future owner of this property, they're willing to sell that, that fee to that property. And so what the land trust wants to do is use the tools that we have to make that possible. If that means, and if a group decides that an easement isn't the right tool, you don't want to have that layer of, of involvement from essentially from the state of Minnesota, the land trust will step away and, if, and to help you find a different path forward. But we can and will continue to go forward <laughs> to try to help not just on this parcel, but on parcels all, all around the, the monument here. Are the organizations committed to helping and finding a path forward. Um, next, Lauren. And then also, as Lauren said, there's, this is a parcel that's owned by the city of Pipestone. Um, we've talked 
with someone at the DNR on the bottom, it's most of this parcel is in the floodplain. It, most of it probably can't be developed. So while they have some, some plans that they might consider, most of that would, would have to be in the northern part of the parcel. Um, it's our intention is, my intention and the intention of the land trust to start negotiating with the city of Pipestone to see if they'd be willing to find a way to transfer ownership of that parcel to another group for us to put uh, some restrictions on that property to restrict the development of that property so it stays in a natural state um, and to work to find a path of natural restoration on that parcel as well. Um, and then next please, Lauren. And then part of that, this is one of the things that I found the most exciting. This is an image from 1938. Um, you can see the, the blue line that runs through is the original channel. Well, it's not the original channel. Um, these things move. You can see original public land survey plot maps show the Pipestone Creek path. And as, if you can see, that this is the, an old image of the monument, so the roads aren't the same. But the red and the blue lines are the path of the Pipestone Creek. And now, on the, and sort of in the middle of the image there, the black line, the, as Lauren mentioned, the Pipestone Creek has been channelized as essentially a drainage ditch as it comes into the monument. Um, we've spoken with someone from the Department of Natural Resources in Minnesota said that, you know, would it be an option to restore the original path of this creek so that we can provide some water quality benefits into the park? And he said, absolutely. Um, you know, we would have to have control of that parcel to be able to go down that path. There's significant flooding issues in that part of the community. And so these things would all have to be done to sort of mitigate any flooding concerns. But it's an exciting thing to think about that we may be able to rewild the pipes on Creek before it gets into, into the monument again. So this is something we'll look, continue to look on if we can sort of get in negotiations with and find a path forward with those current landowners in that area. Uh, next, please, Lauren. Next steps. Um, we are working with the um, Pipestone Development Commission to engage in the, the terms of a conservation easement um, in consultation with FAITH and the Treaty Committee. Um, and then ultimately, we would like to identify a buyer, an ultimate buyer for the property. The Pipestone Development Commission is willing to sell. They would prefer to sell. Um, and so who that next property owner would be, it's something that we should work towards and identify as we're working on this process. And then this is a great opportunity for, for the property to be restored. It's currently farmed. Um, it could, some of it would have been natural wetland and obviously prairie, but the land trust tradition commonly or usually goes through restoration processes with, with uh, parcels, especially if they're just in uh, farm fields, cropland. Um, so that's another thing we could do in consultation with the next landowner and say, what do you want this parcel to look like? What do you want to do on, the, on this property? And then as we said, the ultimate sale of the land to new owners. The land trust does, if there's an easement on the property, the land trust does have the obligation to monitor that property every year. But that's another thing that we can do. We train volunteers, we can train representatives from whichever group the future landowner decides to be the monitors of that property so that I'm not the one out there trying to say what's going right with the property. We can step away. Um, next, please, Lauren. And this is just as to uh, acknowledge that there's, there's been a lot of discussions about this in the past. I've only come to this very recently, um, but there's a lot of work that's been done by many people over the years. So just to, thank, just to give thanks and say, I acknowledge that the work's been done. Um, and there's some contact information for me if anybody wants it. So Faith, do you wanna speak some more? So I know it's getting late and we only have a little bit of time, but are there any um, questions, comments, input? When Chad said whoever the future owner, owner will be, we hope Ihangtong will be part of that. But we're not 
we're open to whatever Oshpayas of the Ocheti want to come forward, but it's not a passive position. It's not just to, you guys go ahead and do the work. Or you women go ahead and do the work in this case. But um, that is gonna take a lot of hard spiritual work to pursue, pursue this in a good way. And the really exciting thing for me is water because that whole Pipestone Creek has been, it's concrete. It's been totally changed. And so the idea of being able to restore it to a native grassland, especially that agricultural area, and there's other land areas around, and those veins of the Pipestone Quarry go way far out, and that's what people are mining, and that's what they're selling. The other thing that we've talked about, and I know Misimkana Arvel has talked about that for years, is that we need to pursue, pursue legislation to make the sale of pipestone illegal, just like eagle feathers. That's the other thing. We need a new generation of young people to step forward, because we've done that. I'm 74, and we've been involved in other legislative things, but it's time for the young ones to say, I'll be part of that. We'll get draft legislation, and we'll follow it. And you have to follow it once you, you can't expect it just to happen because Congress is not always friendly. And we only have two years until the, the change that possibly we hope won't come. But questions? Daku Iduk Jumpy. Phil Tuigal here. Um, is this an actual full ownership opportunity or is this a, a, a monument co management opportunity? At this point, it would be uh, ownership because it's not national land, federal land. It's private land. If that, if that is the case, then the actual owners should be the Ocheti, Shakoni, Oyate. And that's what we'll have to negotiate because when we did this negotiation, we didn't make any pr pronouncements of what anybody should be because we're still in the spiritual praying part of these doors opening. So now when we come together in a circle, will bring those ideas forth. It's not for anybody to tell anybody how to do it. It's to talk together uh, like uh, Wolakota, Odakota. Let's sit down and not making orders, but saying, how do we do this? You, you could set a um, board of um, a council fire as the uh, overseeing uh, yeah. entity uh, representative from each tribe. And that, that's probably the first meeting that we need to do because it's kind of like at the TIPO meeting yesterday, we were talking about the impact of NAGPRA and we had conversations that we need to think about how we were before NAGPRA. We need to think about how we were when we used that together. So we need to start there. We need to start all over to go back and get that feeling and get those directions for, from the Wichanaki. They'll guide us. I firmly believe that they will guide us on how it's gonna go. And I, as a Ihangtua, I'm not gonna tell you or order you how it should be, but we just work hard. We're just working hard to make this happen. Oh, huh? Oh, uh, <coughs> thank you. Misukra. Uh, よかわれはおなじびきれえ、え、たくかしな、え、おやて、あの、きちゅわぴ。なは、で、ちゃのぽちゃたは、え、おな、独特なたは、あの、say in support of uh, the pipestone quarries and as a bundle keeper, the keeper of sacred pipe. No, I, I was uh, with the elders about not protecting the pipestone quarries. And they told me that, the, like I said, couple days ago that uh, the red pipe stone is the blood of our people. Mm. And the same amount of iron 
and the pipe stone quarries is in our body. That Mother Earth is a living spirit. And according to uh, the prophecy is that, uh, you know, if we don't uh, respect the red pipe stone, it starts to do a turn color. And that is happening. Back in uh, my grandmother, she told me about a story about you know, the abuse of uh, the sacred lands and sacred sites. And then wrongfully taking, illegal, illegally taking the land and the pipestone quarries that uh, something would happen. Mm -hmm. And that happened and uh, it's called the Dirty Thirties, when uh, it's called the Dust Bowl that came across the, the lands. And, and uh, what hook pick, you know, when you start abusing something sacred, then things fall back on our people. So I grew up, grew up uh, with the stories of uh, the pipestone quarries and then we start running to Pipestone back, I think, uh, back in the 80s to protect the Pipestone quarries. And at the time, the, we've asked uh, the Ocheti Shakoni or we've asked help from the people to help us stand at Pipestone, but just a handful of people. And it's sad that in this world today, the lack of respect for our sacred pipe stone or that Chanupa, because, you know, today we talk about the abuse of our ceremonies and our way of life. And today young people are standing up to protect the sacred, like the, over at Standing Rock, we, we stood up for the Minuichwani. But during those times of meetings, they said that the uh, Hong Tua and Wak Petrua, they were, long time ago, they were t chosen to be uh, protecting, taking care of the pipe stone quarries. And that was told by the elders for the people. And so that was, uh, I guess, a uh, little bit of history. You know? But there's a lot of uh, words or history about uh, the Pipestone Quarries. And, but uh, from that time, we walk and run to Pipestone. You know, a lot of them have passed on too. But you know, the police, they told us to run in, along the ditch because we're going to uh, Pipestone quarries. They asked us where we're going. But we kept on because we believe in following the spirit. We believe in making a change. So I, I believe that change did happen. Now they're working with us today and they're more open to uh, work, th work with our people. So I'd like to say that much. Thank you very much. Mm. Hello. Yeah, Wopira. I think um, taking off from those words from the historical record, historical record is a really important thing because we step into causes, we step into actions or movements, and we don't have the history. So this is a new chapter that's opening. We are, it's land back. It's uh, legislative. There are really answers to prayers that are happening right now 
So I think as part of this new historical record, when we convene in Pipestone, that if you come, you have to make Wochunza and not make all kinds of speeches and ne never show up again. And then you have to bring the young people, like the young lady from KU. We need those type of people to be documenting everything because the historical record is that I'm 74, I'm gonna go for 100, so hopefully I'll be around here for a long while. But these young ones are part of that historical record. When we show them how to negotiate each other on who's gonna be the owners, how we're gonna do that together, we are role modeling um, Odakota. How do we talk to each other? We don't reify how the treaties were done. We don't fight over it. We begin, and this is a place, of, of all places to do it, at Chanupa Oche, which is a place of peace. So some of us can go there for learning, because a lot of times, you know how we get the habit of getting chanzeka with consultations? I just have that habit in my body. I get all ready to fight when I go into those consultations. But this is a consultation with ourselves. We are consulting with ourselves at this point, which is a new day. And now we have a superintendent who is very open, and I keep worrying about that they're gonna send her somewhere. I said, Lauren, don't let them send you anywhere. She has no control over that, but we gotta really value what she's able to do for us, because she's um, moving fast. We, um, my son was a tipo for a while. He's an elected leader. Now he jumped into the fire, but um, he asked for a TCP, and so they funded it at the Park Service. And so all of the Ocheti will be part of that TCP, and that will happen in 2023. And if we're able to acquire some of those other lands, they would be part of that TCP, that Traditional Cultural Property Survey. And a lot of it has to be restored. When we were there, the last meeting, we were walking up the trail, and we were told there's kind of a small, it's not really a dam, but it's reconstructed. And they said they made the little Wakanja build that dam. Can you imagine those poor little kids? I mean, I, they understood the spiritual significance of it because their work still stands there. But there's so much history, and they don't really know where they're buried. So that LIDAR and all the other stuff that's going to be, there's a lot of work to be done. So if we still have some unhealed stuff about Pipestone, this is a good time to channel it so we don't fight each other so we can make relationship with the land again. And then I know those we Chanahi, those older ones will guide us because we, we all have witnessed that, those doors open. So, oh, huh, they're gonna throw us off here. So any more questions? Two more questions? No? Kahashi, uh, come on up. Okay. Thank you. He's, oh, all right. did he have a question? Wopila. Wopila. Where? Give her Wopila. Thank you. Gosh, Richard. What up? Yeah. Good job. Kokai Chashaki Ignoya Kapo. Okay, Thomas, she asked uh, Orville and Ivan to come up over here. In a good way, he wants you to come up, both of you. We already did this before it pipes up, uh, there was tower. And you guys said that this is an argument between Ivan and Orville, but it's about protecting Thank you for the beautiful presentations and nice stories. Today, uh, I share a little, I ask a little bit of your time to join me in prayer. Uh, we're going to pray and express our gratitude and our appreciation to two of the most important men in our sacred life. Uh, 
Tanashi Orville Looking Horse and Tanashi Ivan. And if the sisters are here, they're welcome to come up here too. But Tanashi Chokata Uolicha Onigalu Onehan Piktalo Onehan Oche Onichicha Piktalo. I know my two Tanashis for many years now. I know the stories about the Chanupa, but I learned it from their mother, my aunt Cecilia, and their father, Stanley. You can Some of the Wakan stories about the Chanupa was, I heard it from their aunt. I used to go up to green grass and visit the Chanopa, but I must have went on the wrong time because these two clashes were on the way on a trip or something. So I ended up spending a lot of time visiting with Uncle Stanley and uh, my Aunt Cecilia. My Aunt Cecilia was one of the kindest and most beautiful women in Lakota history. She has a smile that uh, really touches your heart and she makes you feel really welcome. She has a way of making you feel welcome to visit the Chanupa. You can't. One of the stories that she had shared with me was that the Chanupa, the power of that pipe. It's in our veins, it's in our where. It's in our bodies, those of you that carry Chanungpa, the power of that pipe is in your veins and in your blood and it's your generations. It's in the genes of the human being. She gave us the powerful re reminder that the pipe is the people. It runs in our veins and it runs in our genes. We inherit the love of life of the Lakota way through the teachings of the pipe and then we pass it on to the future generations. Whenever I see my uncles and my relatives, we remind each other about how important life is. You know, some of us pray in sweats and some of us pray in the altar. The family of the Looking Horse family, they're the caretakers of the Chanupa. The pipe is inside of their blood. The pipe is inside of their soul. To me, myself, you know, I don't really need to see the Chanupa. All I have to do is shake hands with my Tahanshi, both of my Tahanshis. That's good enough for me. I believe in a pipe that is still alive today. The Ptehenchala Chanupa. Whenever I hear the topic of the pipe, the first thing that pops into my mind is my Aunt Cecilia. She gave us some powerful teachings. And if she was alive here today, she would gather her sons, take them in their arms and say, Unshiki Chilapi, Oyate Ki the whole pipe, the family of the looking horse, Martina, Beatrice. Hundreds of years have passed. As to us Lakota people, these two men are very important to all of us. The end of the era of carrying our Chanupa will come to an end. These are the last two. And the other, the whole family. 
we as pipe people, the buffalo people, we should have taken care of, taken better care of our caretakers of the pipe. We say Ocheti, Shakoing, the tribal governments, seven council fires. You know, they have resources. They should have built houses for this family, each family member, because they can. They shouldn't have to stay here and there. The Chanupa, they take care of that for all of us. Or okay, that's just how it is, I guess. We live in a colonized world. We only need it. We only greet them when we need them. Oh, Ash. Well, now we talk to the We're the old people now. We're the history. We talk about our historical relatives, the people that signed treaties. But there is no plan in place what our future is going to be like. Where is the infrastructure? Where is the government? What's going to look like? In 2024, when a not so good guy gets back into the White House, by the stroke of the pen, he can just do away with the tribal governments. It's that easy. But the Lakota, we don't have a plan in place. What's a Congress of the Teton Nation going to look like? What is it going to look like for the grandchildren in the future when we're all gone? For Chunkeng, now is the time. Now is the time to renew our relationships, renew our lives. The historical what is Wakhan? It's inside of our DNA, it's inside of the blood of our people. We inherit negative energies from our ancestors that were Americanized. We learn how to touch the alcohol. We learn how to gossip with one another. We learn how to disown each other. What still remains sacred among our people is the love of our spiritual being inside of our blood. All of us, we have Inaz, our mothers. The power of the woman, the mothers, never dies. At this time, I'm going to ask Kahanshi Orbo to tell Nakahit, Licha Yauna Chanopa Kihildinar, Kahanshi Ivan, Licha Una Lenarjina. What you need to talk to Lord? Hetaku No. The Darla When you, uh, I, wa I want to say something. Oh. And you run a ceremony. But what I'm going to say is that, uh, no, 1966 when the elders made me uh, Chanupa Wanka, the bundle keeper, keeper of the sacred pipe, I was the only one. And it was by spirit that they told me that I would be the only bundle keeper until I make that journey in that spirit world. But recently, you no, know, Ivan has been trying to tell me what to do. And more so because he said, Dochete Shakoin made me a spiritual leader. And he said that uh, Dochete Shakoin is going to have a Sundance and I said, okay, but when he started 
that Sundance in Standing Rock, no, he never finished four years, four days, four years. And he was trying to tell me, he came to my Sundance in Greengrass, we were having a gift.